Shalom, Chavarim. Welcome to the Jewish Road Podcast. We are here to help Christians make sense of their roots so they can help the Jewish people make sense of Jesus. My name is Matt, and I'm here with my dad, Ron. Shalom, shalom. There you go. Hey, we're excited because we're towards the end of the year here, and we are in the midst of coming up on yet another holiday. We, we party all year long. Yeah. Well, you know what the saying is, they tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. There you go. And speaking of eating, uh, we're, we're just finishing up Thanksgiving. And right after Thanksgiving, we have Hanukkah. Comes early this year. It does. Yeah. Uh, remember the year, it was a few years back, where it was literally the first night of Hanukkah was on the evening of, on Thanksgiving evening. And we called it Thanksgivica, and there was all kinds of hoopla. And... Well, that was that was a, a year or two ago. Uh, I think it was like five years ago. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Barely would know for sure. Yeah, I don't know. All right. So uh, we're here, but before we jump into all of that, we got two two housekeeping pieces of business here. Uh, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we are based here in Central Kentucky, and we have some goals and dreams for this next year. Uh, over the next month, before year end, we want to raise $25,000, and we have four things that we want to do with that. Um, we want to continue our podcasts here, because um, we're having fun. with. Are you having fun with this? I'm having fun. Yeah. You, I mean, you've never talked this, in front of a microphone yeah, so much. No. Yeah. This and, is fun. This is fun. Yeah. And so, so far, uh, you know, people I think are listening to this, uh, to us and, and kind of learning something. So it's been fun. Uh, so we want to also not just do the podcasts on the audio side. Hey, are you listening to me? No, you're not. Yeah. If you could only see what's going on right now, you're, you're literally reading over there and I'm trying to talk. If, if you're not going to listen to me, how are they going to listen to me? Well, they can listen to you. I don't have to listen oh, to you for goodness. them to listen to you. Right. But you're also like reading somewhat out loud. Like go back 30 seconds, folks, and you'll hear like there's this whispering in the mic. Yeah. You can't hear it, but I can because I'm wearing headphones. Yeah. yeah. I wish you would stop talking so much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> podcast. The other thing we want to do for next year is we want to build a video studio right here in the podcast studio so we can take our faces and plaster them all over the internet, right? It's just a warning. Yeah. <laughs> You've been warned. So yeah, give to us so that you can see our faces. Right? That's the ultimate threat right there. Uh, but we want to build a video studio. We want to do some uh, course content and train. We have a lot of people that are saying, hey, what, what do the Jewish people think of Jesus? Uh, how do we actually reach out to them? So we have some ideas and we have some things, some courses that we want to put out there to be able to equip folks that are trying to reach out to the Jewish people. And if you're a Jewish person and you want to know more um, and why we're so crazy, that's great. Uh, we're also going to do some live events and this will get us out into the community. We want to host dinners for, for the Jewish people, the Jewish community. We want to host some dinners for some pastors in the area and be able to re relate mm -hmm. and reach out to them. And we're writing some books. Is that right? Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Were you reading again, not listening to me? Yeah. <laughs> Forget books. it. I'm all by myself here. It's like me. I just might as well just go in a closet. And... I, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. So uh, not, not full-fledged books. We're not there yet, but baby steps. Uh, this will be a resource, an ebook. And what we're doing is uh, we're going to take on this first one. We are asking questions. What are questions that every Jew should be asking about Christmas? We, we thought, you know, is Christmas Jewish? Well, not kind of how we really celebrate it today, but there are some things that we think that the Jewish people should be asking about the Christmas story, the incarnation. So we're ready. This about is it. kind of like what your rabbi won't tell you. There you go. Ooh, that's kind of provocative. Is it too late to change the title? Just came to me. Yeah. Well, where were you last week when we were trying to think of these? All right. So uh, that's all the business you can give uh, by going to thejewishroad.com slash donate. And uh, when you go there, uh, you can find out all the other information and see a little bit more about that. Before we jump into Hanukkah, let's tell a joke or two. You oh. have one? I gotta tell well, you, the last the last podcast, I was a little disappointed. Like we gotta move away from the one liners. The one line, okay. Less how, one liners. How about this? Ira, an older Jewish man, is is driving home. He's uh, heading out uh, out of the city uh, into uh, Long Island, and uh, all of a sudden, the policeman stops him, pulls him over, stops him, and he walks up to the car and he says, "Listen, sir, I need to I need to tell you, uh, your wife fell out of the car about two miles back." Oh, thank goodness. I thought I'd gone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, if, you need, if you ever need help, 
uh, just explaining. You didn't get the the joke. Uh, feel free. You can email us at shalom at the Jewish road. Say, I didn't get it. I didn't understand the Jewish humor. And uh, we'll respond right away and tell you why that was funny. I have one. Ready? This is, a, this is about a, a rabbi. Uh, there's a rabbi, and he's harboring a secret. The secret is he's always wanted to try pork. Ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> you know, I, I once knew a rabbi who really loved moons over my hammy at Denny's. Uh. Anyway, this rabbi, he really wanted to try pork. So one night, he drives across town to the furthest restaurant from his synagogue. And he orders an entire suckling pig. And just as the waiter sets the full roasted pig down with an apple in its mouth, he sees a group of his congregants that just walked in. (laughs) They see him with the big pig there, and their mouths are hanging wide open. The rabbi, knowing he's been caught, he widens his eyes and he says, What kind of place is this? You order an apple and look how it's served. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. I like that. Thank you. We'll be here all episode. All right. We are going to transition into talking about something uh, legitimately maybe more consequential and important. Yeah. Um, Last podcast, we talked about 400 years of waiting, uh, and we talked about the end of the story in Genesis and the key figure there is Joseph. Yeah, 400 years, yeah. 400, I'm just making sure you're still listening to Joseph, me. Joseph, I'm here. Okay. Joseph gives command. He says, when I, when I die, a deliverer is going to come, and I want you to take my bones and... Take them with you to the land that God promised. Right. And a deliverer will come. They just didn't know. Joseph's family at that time didn't know they were going to be waiting 400 years. Yeah, that was the beginning. Right. And so we follow his narrative, and he goes... He dies, and 400 years later, there's a new pharaoh, and uh, eventually, we, you know, we have Charlton Heston, and he says, let my people go, and they make their exodus, and right there in Exodus 13, as they are crossing through the Red Sea, they're also, the scripture says it, they're taking Joseph out, and they carry him through the Red Sea, and I see you, like, gesturing, you're going to say something they, else. They are schlepping him through the wilderness there for 40 years. That's right, schlepping. That means uh, carrying with great effort. <laughs> And uh, they finally get in, and uh, his body, his bones are buried uh, right there in Shechem. Right. Now, that's that story. Go back to the last, I think that was episode 10. Uh, we're going to fast forward, though. There's another period of 400, and this is interesting. And that 400 takes place between Act 1 and Act 2. It's the, uh, it's the space between Malachi and Matthew. But in the Hebrew Bible, it's the space between Chronicles and Matthew. That's right. And again, it's a period of waiting. And it's also a waiting for a deliverer. Now, oftentimes we call that period the silent years. Yeah. Why is that wrong? Yeah. Well, because uh, God sent no prophet and he wasn't speaking. So it's not, it's not really wrong in one sense, but in another sense, uh, God was speaking loud and clear. Yeah. So... Out of this period, and this would be, it's that it's that four hundred years that's roughly what fourth century, um, going all the way up to the turn. I don't know what they call that when you get to zero. It's like what year are we? Happy, you yeah. know? Can you imagine that New Year's party? Happy yeah. zero or happy one? Yeah, I'm well, sure. Yeah, don't don't dwell on zero. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, but that this is that four hundred years, and there is a a narrative. There is a story, historical piece that takes place during this time, that illumines, and all of this is leading up to the deliverer who would come, the Messiah. We call him Yeshua, Jesus. So, give us a, a little bit of a backdrop of what's what's happening during this time. Well, what's what's happening during this time? Uh, it's really kind of exciting because uh, from a historical point of view, what is taking place, uh, there, there was a, uh, a world leader that rose up. Uh, his name was Alexander. You probably know Alexander as Alexander the Great. Uh, he actually became uh, leader um, 
of the empire, the Greek empire, uh, when he was a teenager. His father had died, and he assumed the reins of leadership, and within a very short time, he conquered the entire known world. Yeah, he came to power very quickly, and he ruled the whole world very quickly. It yeah. was a whirlwind. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, and he died very young, uh, probably in his early 30s. Yeah, I believe And so 35. from the... From the time he took over, within 13 years, he had conquered the entire world. And so when he died, four generals of his rose up, and out of those four generals, two became prominent. One was in the south, uh, who was known as a leader of the Ptolemies. That was Egypt. That was down in Egypt in the south. And the Seleucids, another general, um, the Seleucids up in the north more by syria area. by syria and here's israel sandwiched between the two of them they're always sandwiched and, and israel <laughs> even today has always been this land bridge it's always been this connecting piece it's it's the place where you would travel from one battle to another but it's also the place where it was the middle ground where you know, it was a trade route if you wanted to get from that african continent and you want to go up to what is you know modern day turkey or go up to syria you have to go through israel to get that land whoever owned that land you had the upper hand it was yeah. power and it's why it's always been contested even to this day yeah and unfortunately israel being right in the middle became a political football in the middle of all this between egypt and syria so uh we have uh we, we have egypt falling under the uh power of the Ptolemies and, uh, and Syria under the Seleucids. And uh, the, the Seleucids actually wanted to introduce more of Greek culture into the world. And uh, it was a Hellenistic culture. And the Jewish people, many of them, migrated toward that. Uh, and it really kind of divided the Israeli society. Oh, in, this is the thing that you, know, you learn in history class. Hellenization is taking <clears throat> over, right? So we're going to have... This, this culture that's going to now take over. Forget what you are, who you are. Um, we're going to have one world, and we're all going to speak the same language. We're going to eat the same food, You know, disappear all of your culture, and you're going to adapt and absorb ours. Yeah, and you had, you had certain Jews who were pious Jews, who were observant Jews, who really opposed this Greek influence. And then you had uh, others who were Hellenist Jews, uh, who adopted the Greek lifestyle. They accepted the new moral codes that were there. They embraced the foreign religious practices of, of the Greeks. Uh, you know, they, they built a stadium next uh, to the Temple Hill for the practice of the Greek games, and uh, they had no problem with that. In fact, part of the Greek games, the people would run out onto the field and play nude. Oh. And well, so... You know, less hindrance that way. You probably run a little bit faster <laughs> that way. Yeah, well, they definitely didn't need any equipment repairs. <laughs> the, the the people were just kind of becoming immersed in this culture, and there are even comments on this in the book of Maccabees, which are apocryphal books. They're not part of the biblical canon, and yet they are pretty good, to a certain extent, historical accounts of what was taking place uh, in those times that time of the silent years. All right, so that's, that's good background. Let's get to the war. There's, there's a leader that rises up, right? There's, there's a leader who rises up uh, out of the north, a great leader, and his name is Antiochus IV. And he gave himself the name Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the, uh, the, the uh, great God. Like, like a God, like right? A, right? So if you have an epiphany, it's like a God-like moment. Yeah. God enters in. Yeah. And the, the Jewish people uh, didn't like him too much, and they uh, changed two consonants in the name, and they called him Epimenes. There you go. Which, which means, means uh, Antiochus the madman. <laughs> there you go. Just, just to get him a little bit. Yeah. All right. And so um, you have Antiochus uh, who uh, is, is ruling this section, and he has, he's at war back and forth between Egypt and and uh, goes back and forth from Egypt to Syria and does about two or three campaigns and uh, finally is not successful. And when he's not successful, as he's making his way back to Syria, he takes out all of his frustration on the Jewish people in Israel as he goes through there. And uh, this is when he goes into the Jewish temple. 
he offers a, he takes down the altar, puts up a pagan altar, puts up a statue of Zeus, actually, and he offers a pig on the altar and uh, demands that all of the Jews follow this pagan worship. Now, this is taking place in a town in Israel. It's called Modi'in. Modi'in, yeah. And you can actually, it's, it's between... Uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And today you go there, it's a pretty modern city. Yeah. Um, not, not a lot to see as far as... We, it's not one of those stops that we make on a, on a tour to Israel, but it's yeah. always... I always remember Modi'in because when we leave our hotel in Jerusalem and we head back to the airport in Tel Aviv, we're always... You always see the signs on the highway there for yeah. Modi'in. And I yeah. say, a great yeah. miracle happened there. Yeah, and it's amazing. It was only about 12 miles north northwest of Jerusalem. Right. So yeah. Antiochus sends his army in there. They, they commit this, this abomination uh, right there in, in the temple. And he hands down a decree. And he, he issues a decree. And what he's doing here is he is forbidding several important facets of Jewish life. Um, these are really pillars of Jewish life. Uh, he forbids the practice of Judaism. Um, uh, he forbids the, the practice of reading Torah and keeping the dietary laws, uh, and he forbids circumcision. And, you know, uh, he commits the abomination of desolation, and uh, the Jewish people revolt at this point in terms of what had happened. The, there was a leader in Modi'in, and uh, Antiochus sent his general down and uh, demanded that the priest, who was Mattathias, be an example to his people by sacrificing a pig on the altar. And Mattathias refused to do that. Right. Now the story goes, this is where we get the, the, the family name of Maccabees. Yeah. Mattathias is the old man dad. He's the, he's the priest yeah. there. He has five sons. Five sons. And uh, we hear a lot about Judah. Judah, Maccabee. Right. Yeah. And, and so at this place, you know, Mattathias says, not going to do it. Uh, he says, we're not going to make this happen. And, and this starts the beginning of a revolt. But he, it wasn't just a verbal, hey, we're not doing it. You got to move out. It, it got a little bloody there. It wasn't just a resistance. Uh, he actually, there were some Jews who were kind of going along with what was taking place. Uh, you know, we can get it. We can get a sense of that by what's going on today, even. But they were going along with uh, with this, uh, you know, demand from the Seleucids, from Antiochus, and those out of those Jews. Mattathias actually killed one, and then he turned around and killed the representative of Antiochus as well. Which in is his an refusal. act of war. Huh? It's an act of war it's in an act, and of itself. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the act of war resulted in Antiochus very quickly coming down and massacring uh, men and women and children and the animals. Uh, it's said that there was, in one day, about a thousand people killed. Uh, during that time. Uh, th- that's recorded in First Maccabees uh, chapter 1, so just in a historical account. And that triggered the revolt that took place in 167 B.C. All right, so this is 167 years, roughly, 160 years before, before, Messiah. before the coming of Jesus, be- before the coming of Messiah. But this starts this revolt that would now take three years. It's a three-year battle. Hmm. And this is, it's not equal sides. This is not uh, two equal factions that are actually fighting against each other. The Maccabees are a small tribe. Yeah. They're, they're employing, and you can read. It's a great read, actually. You look at first and second Maccabees are great. And then it gets a little weird as you keep going. So I'd, I'd stop there. But unless you like fantasy novels and you can, the rest of it kind of <laughs> reads like that. But uh, it's guerrilla warfare. And, and they're going through, and they are pushing back Antiochus's army. And, and Judah is leading that. And uh, 
uh, actually the Maccabees. Maccabee means a hammer. That's right. <laughs> and Judah was like, uh, like a hammer hammering against uh, the Seleucid army uh, that was coming against them. And actually, they, he and the five brothers uh, hammered their, their way through, and they prevailed against the Syrians. And so they have victory. And the victory takes place in uh, 164 BC. And now that there's a mess throughout the country and the temples have been desecrated right. and the land has been ransacked, now we have to recover. Yeah. We, so what, what they do at this point is there's a cleansing of the temple. And uh, when we say a cleansing of the temple, uh, they... they made and prepared new holy vessels, a uh, new lampstand, an altar of incense, uh, a table of the showbread and curtains, all of these things new as a part of the cleansing of the temple. And when all of that was done, they rededicated the temple um, three years, actually, to the day after the desecration on the 25th of the month of Kislev. So as they're going through there, uh, there's a couple of things that have come up uh, in the legend and in the story. Now, what we've just told you is historically accurate. This is what happened. Uh, but give it a little bit of time, too. There there have been a couple of legends that come out of it. Yeah. Um, and so let's put those straight. Yeah. Well, you know, on, on Hanukkah, we, uh, we light the candles. We have a menorah that has eight candles in it, one for each night. And uh, the legend is, is that there was not enough oil in, uh, in rededicating the temple, but to last for one night. And miraculously, uh, the oil lasted for eight nights. And this is why the, uh, the celebration of Hanukkah goes eight days with eight candles. However... Uh, there is no historical record of any such miracle taking place. Uh, so that, that's the story that uh, goes through most Jewish homes. What, what's, what is interesting is that at, at this point, when this feast is first put into place, when it's first inaugurated, it was done after a model of the rededication of the first temple by King Solomon. And when he dedicated that temple, he decided that the celebration, the festivities of dedicating the temple to God should follow uh, those of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, which lasted eight days. And so the dedication was observed for eight days with the kindling of the lampstands. And the Maccabees decided to imitate those celebrations and uh, observe the rededication of the temple that uh, they had taken back from the Seleucids for eight days. Um, so uh, that, that seems to be a more viable uh, you know, understanding of how we got an eight-day uh, celebration of Hanukkah. Now, another you know, story that we hear coming out of that is you know, they had to make more oil. There is a process of making more oil. And so uh, a lot of people will say today that that, that was the miracle of Hanukkah. Um, but we think that there's another miracle that comes out of it. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But I think you have something there that you want to read. Well, uh, it was interesting that Josephus noted that uh, he said so much pleasure did they find in the renewal of their customs and in unexpectedly obtaining the right to have their own service after so long a time that they made a law that their descendants should celebrate the restoration of the temple service for eight days. And from that time to the present, we observe this festival, which we call a festival of lights, giving the name to it, I think, uh, from the fact that the right to worship appeared to us at a time when we hardly dared hope for it. And so we, we have a documentation of, uh, of Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. First uh, century. First century, probably not a believer, but was an accurate uh, and very viable Jewish historian uh, accounting for how this uh, this celebration came. It's not a it's not a feast day that was given like those that were given to the Jewish people in Leviticus 23, where God says, "You shall keep this. You shall do this on this day. On the fifteenth day, you shall do this." It's it's nothing like that, but it is a celebration of something that God had done uh, once again. His providential hand is upon his people because there's something that 
took place that could not have taken place had uh, Antiochus and uh, the Seleucids been successful in destroying the Jewish people. So uh, we're going to throw out a bonus episode right after this one. And we'll talk about in there, what are the different elements that we, we use and how do we celebrate Hanukkah today? Um, and so but part of that is uh, we, we have the menorah and we have the dreidels. And so we'll, we'll get to that. But there is, there is this piece of, of light. Is, light is a theme here. And you just said uh, the festival of lights uh, was something. But uh, it's also known, Hanukkah is also known as the Feast of Dedication. dedication. Now, if only so every everything we've said up until this point is is was from the apocryphal writings, right? From first and second Maccabees. Yeah, right. And, and some cooperation from Josephus there. Right. If only a bit of this, if if only something like this would show up in scripture, then we'd have a little bit more validation. Yeah. And and you know the scripture, the Hebrew scriptures don't mention Hanukkah per se. And yet, uh, Daniel prophesied the events uh, that arose during this particular time, particularly in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11. Yeah. So here, here's the crux, and, and here's where we really want to push this. Um, this festival of lights, this feast of dedication, um, if we can wrap this, um, this is something that Jesus actually observed. And I, yeah. we talked to a lot of, you know, you know, Christians that say, you know, I want to be like Jesus. If Jesus did it, it's good enough for me. I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they don't do everything. Yeah. And so here's a little bit of an encouragement. But where does Hanukkah actually show up in the biblical narrative? It's not in Act 1, the Old Testament. No. It actually shows up there in Act 2. Yeah. And well, it's it in, shows up in Act 1 to a, to a sense, yeah, yeah, prophetically. In Daniel, in Daniel, prophetically. Right. It, it, it's coming, yeah. and it's talking Antiochus, and we have the horns in Daniel, and boy, that's a whole right. thing right there. Right. Um, but, but Jesus, this is in John chapter 10, John 10, 22, and it says this, At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. I mean, stop there. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times have we read through that, and we just... Pass right over, like well, what feast yeah. of dedication? All right, well, let's keep going, right? Yeah. Like we just don't know, we yeah. don't we don't pick up on yeah. that. Well, it, it's such an indicator as to the Jewishness of this whole book, even the Gospels, and you know, even though the New Testament had not yet been written, when it was written, there was an account of what was taking place according to the Jewish customs. Yeah, and it's, these are Jewish people celebrating Jewish holidays. Yeah. Jesus, yeah, was a Jew. Yeah, and, and he's celebrating something. That is is in remembrance of his Jewish people. He is giving such credibility to what took place in the days of the Maccabees that he makes time to make sure he's at the temple at the Feast of Dedication. So he is there, John 10, 22, at the Feast of Dedication. It took place at Jerusalem, and then it says, it was winter which is the season that we're moving right into. Yeah. And again, with our Hebrew calendar, the, the dates are always a moving target uh, for our calendar. But it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Solomon. And that's it. That's all we have for that's the Feast it. of Dedication. That's it. And if you don't know anything about the history of that celebration, then it's not very significant what Jesus did when John says that he was walking in the temple in Jerusalem, in the Feast of Dedication. It's not important that he was there. It's not important that he kept it, that he thought it was important, but it was important. And the historical background that we have of the Maccabean Revolt and the restoration of the temple, uh, not to mention, that was a near prophecy that Daniel gave back then. But Daniel also gave a far prophecy, not of Antiochus Epiphanes, but of one who was going to come Later, later even than where we are today, we're talking about thousands of years from the time the prophecy was given. Beyond all of our current day, modern day celebrations, and we'll talk about that in our little bonus uh, episode that's coming next, but beyond that, I, I think for me, the, the piece that I really love about this this holiday, um, you know, what what we've done, you know, it, it gets very commercialized. It's just as commercialized, uh, unfortunately, as, as Christmas is. So we're trying to restore the meaning. We try to do that with our kids and your grandkids. 
Uh, but there's 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 two things here. Uh, number one, we like to say this. Uh, Antiochus, his goal was to wipe out the Jewish people, Hellenize everything. Right. Uh, not just the Jewish people. He wanted to Hellenize everybody. Right. There there is no more people groups. But he he wanted to rid himself, rid the planet of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. If he was successful in doing that, 160 plus years before the coming of Jesus. How does that play out? You know, if if he was successful, uh, then there would have been no coming of the Messiah because, you know, he was, you know, Paul says he was born of a woman under the law. If there is no Jewish people, then there is none of that to happen. But, you know, on, on the other hand, we we'll look at uh, the things that are happening, the, the influence of the Greek culture. You know, uh, the Bible says that he was born, he came in the fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, you know, there was there was no other time that was was more a best time for the Messiah to come. They had the roads that were all over the area, had the Pax Romana. Uh, you had the roads that would facilitate people traveling here and there. Uh, you have uh, a common language, more so in the Koine Greek language for the communication. Um, much more conversive than Hebrew. And so everything was set in place in the fullness of time for the Messiah to come, which is really just kind of a testimony, uh, again, of the providence of God, how when everything looks bad, he's using it to his appointed ends. Yeah, he's sovereign. He sees what's going on with everything. And so the summary to what we just said was, essentially, Hanukkah matters because if there was no Hanukkah, there would be no incarnation. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we, we love the Christmas story. We love the incarnation. We love the fact that God becomes man, Emmanuel, God with us. That would not have taken place if Antiochus beats up all of the, the Jewish people uh, 160 plus years yeah. just before that. Yeah. That's one thing. Here's the second thing that I really love about Hanukkah is... It's the Feast of Dedication, uh, and we have the rededication of the temple. And the rededication of the temple uh, is a reminder for us of our own rededication. Uh, there is no more temple in, in Jerusalem, uh, and, and we later would be called that, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. And so you can read about that, 1 Corinthians 6 and 3. I think it's in there a little bit too, uh, but that this is a good time just before we hit our New Year's. Take stock of our lives. Where are we at? But are we cleansing our own temples, and are we rededicating our own temples right. to the Lord? Uh, so this is Hanukkah. Uh, this is a historical, a biblical perspective. And the next thing that we'll do uh, in this next bonus podcast is: so what do we do now? How do we do this? How do we tell that story? Uh, what are the reminders and the, the symbols and the cues? The last thing I'd say is that is all looking back. Um, mm. This next podcast that we're going to do is all looking at how do we do this today? And we're not even scratching the surface on what is to come. Yeah. We'll get there one day. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. We'll never get there, will we? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, let's call it a wrap for this one. Anything else? You good? Uh, I'm good. All right. Well, this is the Jewish Road Podcast. You can find out more at our website, thejewishroad.com, or on social media on Instagram at The Jewish Road. Uh, you can read blogs there, see speaking events, things that are coming up, and you can donate because we have some big plans for this next year. And as always, you can get us at shalom at thejewishroad.com for an email. Hey, thanks for listening. Stay tuned. In the next couple days, we're going to drop a bonus episode on should Christians celebrate Hanukkah? And if you were going to, what would you actually do? Until then, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.